Hey folks, it's John from A's for Alcoholic. What follows is my conversation with John S., somebody who was so key in my sobriety, uh, a friend of mine I've known for years. We tended bar together. Uh, we may have drunk at the same bar a decade or so ago and not even known it. Um, we've been through a lot together, and uh, he was kind enough to come on and talk to me from Hawaii and share his story of sadness and redemption and love and being on the island and living those barstool dreams that we always say we're going to do. So without further ado, here's my conversation with John S. It's no, not for radio, no. I've got the face for radio, that's for sure. <laughs> that's what my mom said, no. Um, no, you were a model, man. That's very true, very true. The highlight of everything. <laughs> um, I think the most interesting thing, well, for me, I should say, but um, is just how our our stories intersect. Oh, yeah. And the the... The many similarities and yeah, the possibility that we may have run into each other at the nightlight or so. <laughs> uh, the monogram <clears throat> towels. Yes. The monogram towels. But um. yeah. Hey, John. John S. as well. <laughs> uh, yeah. Calling you from from Kauai, brother. Thank you for reaching out. Super. Yeah. To, uh, you know, to see your face on the Skype thing. Modern technology. <laughs> yes. Um, so I just kind of wanted to hear your story a little bit and, and have the folks, you know, kind of get a different perspective and also the unique story that is our relationship in, you know, as, as active alcoholics, although we didn't really drink together, did we in Sonoma that we know of? No, you were the, the bar manager and I drank behind <laughs> your back and you pretended not to, uh, <laughs> no, that's is, right uh, that i did i did pretend not to notice i <laughs> i liked you too much i was like i remember when one of the other managers was like you need to fucking do something about that guy yeah. i was like no it's okay it's cool and i was i was trying to be all like no i got it under control he's all right and <sighs> yeah you you carried my denial for me so <laughs> it, it Thank you for belonging uh, things. <laughs> right. yes. I should have fired your ass earlier on. Right? Oh God, you wouldn't have been the first. That's 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 part of the story right there. Um, so going back to like the first time you ever had a drink or how you grew up. You know, where did you grow up? So uh, originally from from Half Moon Bay, California. Mm -hmm. uh, Parents divorced at a at early age three, but not a bitter divorce. Their whole goal was to take care of me. So, and, and no, and neither one of them are alcoholic. So there's, mm -hmm. I don't have the Catholic guilt or the or the bad parents. Um, you know, the the grandparents they they smoke cigarettes and drink drink seven and sevens or whatever, but not to mm -hmm. an abusive kind of thing by any means. So. Uh, pretty solid household went back and forth between um, mom was in San Clemente, Southern California. I was dad was in Northern California. Uh, but drinking the first time I drank, I remember it was a boat launch. Uh, oh, but what I'll say, my parents were an alcoholic, but I was thinking about this the other day. Both my step parents were, uh, mm. which is interesting. Uh, I didn't put all that together until a few years. But uh, yeah, you know, first time I drank, probably about 12 years old. Um, bonfires I, I snuck a, a a beer at every bonfire with a total of about six or so and I was falling I was wandering around with two two younger girls at the time who weren't drinking and and by the end of the bonfire experience remember both the girls joined forces didn't want anything to do with me and I had my my buzz on and <laughs> wandered off and it's kind of that was the story of my life too you know I just turned 50 last month so pretty continuous through there but um you know, the first time drinking, it, it worked. It was a warm feeling on a sunset and a full moon, half moon bay. And but gradually, um, you know, no, no different story than anybody. High school, 
you know, we, we drank not on a daily basis, but binge drinking. I mean, right out of the yeah. gate, I was, you know, throwing up and wandering around and, and, uh, you know, but just to kind of speed it ahead, you know, not that story is, is what it was probably similar to a lot of people, but first, first UI at 17, I had insurance on my car within five hours. I had totaled it and had no plans on totaling that car. Wow. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, what was, a, what was the fallout for that? At 17? Uh, racing my buddy, my, my dad had bought me a used Chevrolet, some kind of Chevette or something, not a Corvette, a Chevette. And I decided mm-hmm. it was a good idea to race my buddy who had a 911 Porsche. I had the shitty little car and some backside roads in Half Moon Bay. A lot of tequila. Yeah. Uh, case of beer in the back. Didn't make a turn. Um, got arrested for that one. And, um, you know, when the cops came, I tried to play it off like somebody ran me off the road and someone else's fault but when they shine the light on the car there that was down at the bottom of this ditch the uh, case of beer rolled out <laughs> so that was no the hiding start. that yeah um so that was at 17 and you graduated high school in uh, half moon bay yeah graduated from there and that whole thing turned into a slap on the wrist that was my story right. for, for a bunch of years you know boys will be boys i hope you learn and and i learned so i i went a good three years before my second dui <laughs> No, five years, five years. I was 22 okay. in right. Half Moon Bay as well. Um, yeah, anyhow, got away with that too, more or less. But I got exp- uh, I got the, the nudge from the judge, and that was uh, my first uh, introduction to AA from mm-hmm. afar, getting that thing filled out. Um, great so you program were, for, you for were, those people. <laughs> so you were court mandated the first time? Court mandated in... At the same time, I started bartending, so I was about two years into bartending, and that kind of... They don't always go hand in hand. <laughs> well, Not at it, that it, young age. It, it started developing. You know, me and you share the many years of, of bartending. So I started bartending at 20, mm-hmm. and I, I was behind the bar up until 42, you know, at the we, we finished up at the same place there in mm-hmm. Sonoma. So, uh, when, so between, yeah, between 22 and Half Moon Bay, um, when did you make it up to Seattle? You went to Manhattan for a while too, right? I mean, I took the bartending show on the road. So I ended up, I left Half Moon Bay. So there was always a girl and a bar somewhere involved. So I ended up in Maui, ended back in San Francisco, just in a nutshell, from San Francisco to Manhattan up to, to Seattle, um, mm-hmm. into the Sonoran desert for a while and, and then ended up in Sonoma. Right. And so the, the Seattle years, um, ah. are the ones that are, that are particularly interesting to me because we were both in Seattle at the same time. We were both tending bar in Seattle. Unbeknownst to her. And Unbeknownst not to yet. each other. Yes. Ah. And my favorite, well, I, I was I was managing this this cocktail lounge up in Ballard, which at the time was this sort of up and coming neighborhood of of Seattle. And you were working downtown at one of the the swanky. Was it where were you working at? So uh, good old El Gaucho. Oh yes, was that big the steakhouse. That's you know, but also kind of coinciding with that. And Seattle, keep in mind, I was. I turned 40 in Seattle, so there was a lot in between there. But that's really when I was becoming unemployable. So in, mm-hmm. I was in Seattle five years, and I was fired from four jobs for drinking, all bar-related. So I had had several jobs in between. Right. I always kept two jobs because I know if the wheels came off at the one, this is me managing my alcoholism. Mm-hmm. I had my fallback or, or my fun bar. You know, where I didn't care if I got fired at. So I, I did a couple years at a, at a brewery. Uh, didn't get fired from there, but was the first time somebody really looked me in the eye and go, you're an alcoholic. Somebody with, you know, somebody I looked up to, um, the owner of the of the, the place, Hales Hales. I'll, I'll throw it out there, whatever that's worth. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, El Gacho, they, they fired me on the spot. I came in. I don't I don't know why or what showed up at two o'clock one afternoon maybe it was a wednesday or thursday 
had two bottles of wine and a, and a cocktail before I got there, and they just looked at me, and it wasn't a discussion. <laughs> it was like... <laughs> And that was a good go. gig, you know. Yeah, yeah you I do. They had the diamond, about. like the diamond martini, where they dropped the diamond in there, and it was yes. like all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. The eighteen dollar, you know, sapphire martis and the ninety dollar steak. So you know, you as a bartender, that like, you make good money in in those kind of situations. But mm -hmm. you know, I worked at the stadium for a while because I knew I could sneak drinks, you know, throughout the stadium in a golf cart. You know, <laughs> chase the Sounders or coming in the Seahawks mm -hmm. and all that. That was, you know, I'm a, a sommelier too. Keep in mind, my background is in wine, but I was more than happy to tap kegs of Budweiser if you threw in a Mike's apple cider or some shit behind the <laughs> beans there. It was really, it didn't matter at that point. Yeah, it, it, it was, I, I, I'm not a snob when it comes to my booze consumption, you know, pink wine out of a box with ice cubes to, to whatever IPAs, I, you know. Isn't no that Gino. funny? <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah, I mean, I know some people have a very specific regimen, and I have a, you know, my co-host Jerry was all about it was nothing. It was Jim Beam and Coke, and that's it. He didn't that's want anything thing. else. He didn't look for anything else. And I was much like you. Um, didn't matter what it was. We could try. Let's experiment. Let's mix a little something. Oh, all we got is one five one white wine and some flat Sprite. <laughs> Let's put it together. Pack it some ice in it, you know, and give it a stir and. It wouldn't matter. So, I well, mean, I was not picky. Give yourself some extra credit there, too, because you were the, you know, before that whole term, you know, mixologist, which I don't like that one bit. But, you know, you, you, you as a bar manager, you had some creations there. And, and my, my thing is every bar I had a different drink. Mm. It was a different oh, okay. kind of drink, a whole different thing. So I wasn't hanging out in one bar all day. I kind of bounced mm -hmm. here and did this and some place did a flight of wines another place it was a martini and then i'm having i'm in a mexican place and then i've got a guinness and the irish place and I you can, were a chameleon can, chameleon yeah yeah you know and part of that survival tactic survival well you know one you know the bartending thing and you know this as well as anybody is you know we we know our our type so you sit at the bar and you commiserate with your your buddy and fucking complain about the the hack down the the line there or something and, the, and you know and you be friendly mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there's three cocktails and then he's in front of your he's in front of you at your bar and it was you know it was uh, a yeah way of, a way of life more of an identity than yes just getting drunk that wasn't the ultimate goal but it was a lifestyle my whole in it day in and day out without a doubt but Seattle was where you began to, when the 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 cracks began to show. Yeah, I mean, you you mentioned El Gaucho, kind of the the fancy steakhouse, but my, you know, we talked about the nightlight there, and that's kind of mm -hmm. the the divey spot, and I closed that place on a nightly basis, and it was paps and and warm vodka, you know, whatever. It was so yeah, down. for for those who don't know, the nightlight was this. Um, divey bar in downtown seattle and it was the kind of place you see in in every movie about some divey bar with like the christmas lights strewn up in between all the beer lights <laughs> and one there was two different sides and one had the pool tables and the jukebox and the other one kind of you had to step down into and that's where these old timers were talking like 80 plus years old were sitting at the bar and sipping on their gin and tonics and it was just dark and it was this this cozy mushroom of a place, you know, and um, I used to go there all the time because Marsha, who yeah. John knows as well, was a bartender who would take care of you. And if you got a double shot of Jameson, which I often did, she would pour it to the brim and say, honey, you're going to want to take a sip off the top of that before you pick it up or you're going to spill it. And so what's what's funny to me is that we. We had to have, as much as I hung out there and as much as you hung out there, at one point or another, we must have been there on the same night. And that's such a trip to me. I mean, Seattle's such a small town in that way when bartenders dive bars and stuff like that. Yeah. I was there um, a good four or five nights a week. There's no doubt about that and many other little bars. So, And also, Marsha cut me off for a year. <laughs> <laughs> or no, 
here's here's how it went. I mean, you had to work real hard. It was hard alcohol. I could only yes. drink beer, <laughs> and I couldn't. Uh, yeah, I don't know wow. the story behind that. But yeah, that was a whole about a whole year. No no shots for me. Wow. I did some, some weird shit somewhere along the line. <laughs> Can't remember exactly what it was. Marsha c- kept you off the hard liquor. Well, she probably saved you uh, a little a few hangovers, but you know. <laughs> It's not it's not hard to get hard liquor in downtown Seattle. No, um, it was not an issue. <laughs> so so um going to the first time that we met that I yes. that I remember that we met, what brought you down to Sonoma from Seattle? Um a, a, a lot of these m- m- routines were, you know, they talk about geographical. So mm-hmm. the the gig was basically up in Seattle and it'd be me following some girl or something so I, I started dating this girl that i went to high school with and found on facebook and we hung out three times and on our fourth date i basically moved in with her and her kids and that would seem very normal to me and it, you know <laughs> i don't know and there i am not working and hiding my empty beer bottles in my golf bag and she got hip to that after a while and that, that ended which was a good thing yeah that brought me to sonoma so that that brought me to petaluma uh, then when I was basically booted out of that house due to a uh, copious amount of whatever, um, thought I'd land in Sonoma. What what a you know great thing to add to the resume. I thought for sure yeah. what they're doing over there, and you were managing the bar over there and interviewed and, me. And I remember that day because we needed a part time bartender, and I interviewed like three or four people, and everyone who came through the door, I was just did not get a good feeling about. I just was like. I don't know, man, you don't know what you're doing or you seem too weird or there was something wrong with everybody. And as soon as you came down, you sat down, you didn't have like you weren't all suited up or anything. You kind of had this sort of, I don't know, J. Crew button up shirt on with the sleeves kind of rolled up. You know, I think it might have been like a little striped Oxford blue something or other. You had (laughs) your hair (laughs) quaffed. You know, you had some the proper like slacks on. You just had some gray slacks and a, a shirt and you were very casual. And I thought, this guy looks like a bartender. He's making me feel comfortable like a bartender. We're just talking. And I immediately was like, we need to hire this guy. Not to mention that we talked about Seattle and we had the same name and all these different things. But I just got this feeling from you that I was like, this guy's going to do good things here, you know, and it was just, uh, that was my, my, was my initial reaction. I don't remember if I called you right away or the next day, but so we worked together at that bar for like a year, maybe more, maybe a year. Somewhere, somewhere, something like a year or so. Yeah. Yeah. We did a couple, a couple of those crazy cocktail competitions together. And (laughs) that's, that's what I remember too, is, you know, us, yeah, I don't, Let's not get into too much of that. No, 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 no. There would be that's... a couple hundred people that, uh, you know, show up and we'd go against all the bars and make the, the cocktails right. and all that and have fun. But after there was one or two of them, uh, I don't know if we went against each other because I went on to another bar, but I got mm-hmm. sober right around that time. So yes. I remember you would have to be the taster. I would, we, I, <laughs> you would, yes. I would create and I, I don't like... know. And it was... Yes. So, so let's go, let's go to that point. Let's go to the point where, so you, you had, you had moved on to a different bar. Um, I was still working at the place I was at. This is around 2013. Is that right? 2012? Uh, 2014. No, 12 and 13. Yeah. My sobriety date is, um, July 12th, 2013. So right okay. in, that, in that that loop somewhere. So you were working at this other place. I still knew you. We talked every once in a while, and I would come up to see you at your bar, and um, you would sometimes pop in for a, for a chocolate cake and come say hi to me. And so what had happened that got you to the point where you had to quit drinking? What what had built up to that wasn't just one event, but it was sort of I'd been introduced to. AA that first time after the second DUI and then after that I, I it was my first time in AA and I think this is important I share the story at the meetings mm-hmm. here I got about a year of sobriety so uh, I did that kind of white knuckling not white knuckling I really enjoyed what was going on here I wanted to get everybody off my back there was some other legal stuff 
And sure enough, the promises came true. I got a year of sobriety, but I didn't work the steps. Uh, mm-hmm. I didn't, didn't have a real sponsor. I had a buddy who had a bunch of sobriety. And, you know, the time comes, and it happened to be on my, my birthday. And uh, I had a, a sip of champagne. That's a great story, but we won't get into all that. But anyhow, so that, that started a 10-year run. Um, move forward on that. I found myself in a hospital in, in, in Tucson. Extreme DTs, the whole bit, people flying in, you know, doctors saying your liver, fatty what? deposits, this, that, and another thing. Pancreas and what year was this? This was... And that would be 2003. Okay, so, so this is early on this happened the first time. Yeah, so about 33, uh, right when I got back from New York. And uh, yeah, so it, I, again, to appease everybody, got about a year of sobriety. Got a buddy in AA, didn't work the steps. Same thing on my birthday. Had mm-hmm. a sip of champagne. It, very interesting that they're they just two, a decade apart. And then I went on another decade run. Um, and that's when in Sonoma, I Super Bowl, I lived uh, the house that you live in now. Mm-hmm. We have our, our pub up the street. You know, walking distance, literally walking distance, uh, uh, less than a a half a mile um i parked my jeep up there and drank all day on super bowl or something and decided i was fine to drive i always thought i you know my mentally i thought it, you know it's a half a mile and um did have my lights on got pulled over and i blew a 3.3 or yeah 3.3 very very, very high special yeah. special treatment on that one uh, i saw my mug shot after that anyhow uh again i go it's a good time i knew about aa I always I thought it was a great concept, and I knew one day it, it, was, it was something kind of like we, you know, when we treat God like a, a commodity, like more of a mm. resource, and then, um, you know, you make your deals and you, you pull your card when you need to. But I just wanted to get a, a a couple months. I went through the court thing, and because my blood alcohol was so high, uh, I had to take an extended nine month course um, up in Santa Rosa there, and anyhow, I'm like I gotta. I got to just stop drinking for a month or two. And I got, I had to get a nudge from the judge. I had to get six, six AA uh, sessions underneath my belt there. And, and I went in and I just started paying attention. I started paying attention a little bit and I've heard some stories and, and what, what just brought me to my knees is um, just, just hearing it and having my, my ears open. Um, so I had five months in the program there and and doing all the right things. And I found out I went out again. So I I had a a relapse there and I didn't, I don't talk about this hardly with anybody, but um, some pretty girl, I was feeling alone. She asked me to go have a beer and I had no, I hadn't done the step. I, I, there, I had no defense, you know, it was up and I'm like, makes perfect sense. So I gave it one more run for about four weeks and I was about ready to lose another job. And I just, found myself at that pool bar that we know at Sonoma Mission Inn at nine o'clock in the morning with a with a warm pint of Grey Goose because the seven up wasn't chilled or whatever. And I'm sipping that because I was shaking so bad. The shakes had really come in, all the all the physical things. So, you know, ten years prior to that, the doctor's saying you're gonna die if you continue. And I ran it another decade and it was starting to really catch up and um and the gig was up. I just something in my a voice in my head goes, this is as good as it'll ever get. And it was the drink at nine o'clock in the morning to stop the shakes. And I go, it's done. And I immediately went back. I knew where to go. And, and I, I finally started doing the step work. I did steps one, two and three that week. I, I was powerless. It was unmanageable. I found mm-hmm. a, a sponsor and I go, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm not going to no matter what. I'm not going to drink for another year. So, you know, a lot of people say don't put a time thing on it or whatever. But I go, I'm going to see how my life changes. I'm going to see because I know the bar will always be there. And I'm going to see how this goes. And I started hearing things in the rooms. I started seeing things in the room. I started experiencing things. Um, I noticed, you know, a lot of people go back to A to get shit back. Kids and husbands or jobs or whatever. I was getting things that I never had. So I found a higher power, you know, and that's mm-hmm. kind of my my journey there. And 
but that's what got me there. It was that third DUI and, and just shit. I thought, I, I thought, well, let's give up driving, you know, and then I would, I'd ride my bike to work and then I used to be staggering on my bike and I go, let's give up the bike. And then I'd be stumbling out. I go, I'm about to get fired again. <laughs> it's all up. I can't even walk home now. That's how bad it's getting. So it's amazing um, how how you make you get those points where you're you're just I'll give this up and it'll be fine and I'll give this up and it'll be fine and it takes so much from you. Um, I I really I just want to go back to that moment. You know, when you talk about like when you said to yourself, you're standing at a pool bar behind a pool bar at nine o'clock in the morning with a warm pint of Grey Goose and Seven Up, and you're like, this is as good as it's ever gonna get if yeah. I keep drinking. Yeah. And just that realization of like, this is as good as it's ever going to get. So what do you want? It, it, then, it was just, I, I physically, emotionally, spiritually had to have a drink to get my day started. And it wasn't even the shaking on the outside. I was internally shaking. My soul was yeah. rattling. My brain, I wasn't focused. I was in this brownout for the last decade. You know, I wasn't. I was drinking to get sober, if that makes sense, you know, just yeah. to function. I had to just, mm -hmm. I wanted to find this magic limit, this, this kind of not too much, and but just enough and, you know, Visine and Altoids and then don't drive in taxis and I'll, I'll, I'll find the loophole. I'll find the loophole, John. You know? I know, I know. I looked for it for a long time. I measured things out, how many bottles, of, and then you forget how much you measured, and so you got to measure a little bit more. And maybe it's Pinot Grigio. Maybe Pinot Grigio is the loophole. You know, maybe if I just drink three bottles of that and I stay off the dark rum, everything will be fine. So I hear you, man. We do a lot of research out there. A lot of research, and then and then then you come to find a few years in sobriety that is not even the booze. So it wasn't the amount or the brand or the the type, mm -hmm. it, it turns out it's an inside job. And I, I thought it was all the exterior shit. You know, if, if the, if my bar manager was cool, like John or, or whatever, <laughs> how did it become so corporate? You know, I don't know. Years, I was trying to catch up with when, you know, going back 25 years ago when you're, when you're, uh, they encourage you to drink behind the bar and now in corporate America or whatever, whatever, they're just, they frown on that. And I get mm -hmm. it. Um, but it was much more than that. It was, it was the inside job, you know, and I basically saw the, I saw the outcome and it was going to be organ failure. So my bottom's death. I still don't, I still haven't hit my bottom. I would have drank myself into the hole and just kind of, you know, maybe at 55, maybe at 60, whatever, how it was going to play out. I, I saw it as some kind of heavy duty drinking organ failure scenario and lots of regrets on my deathbed after already knowing I had my taste of AA I knew the solution was there and let's let's see what happens if I apply myself and um you know I can always back out but it it, it changed my life it absolutely and you know I've shared this with you it's it's not perfect but it's never never been better you know I don't have to mm -hmm drink to get sober i just i'm sober <laughs> you know it's so much two easier. yeah so two years two years on two years sober you yeah. decide and you're still you're still you're bartending sober right yep. yeah you're living in this house that i'm in right now yeah. um, <laughs> and you decide you make a decision to leave california um because you were going to go and move to Hawaii, right? Move to Kauai. My, so what uh, was the plan with that? I mean, what spurred that? You were like, I'm done with this. It's time to move. You got two years under your belt. Well, you know, it, when do you kind of move on? Like they say, don't make any big decisions in that first year, whether mm -hmm. dating or job-wise. But for me, it was a transition. My my sister has been a, a nurse here on Kauai for 22 years and has a five acre farm. And I, I've always wanted, I never even, because I was drinking so much through the years, I never even came out and visited, which yeah. was pretty, was really trippy when I, cause I would just be on the run in different cities. I don't know why. And I, but I lived in Maui before and, and basically what it was, was I want to get out from behind the bar. So yeah. it, it's a, it's a tough move to Hawaii for most people. But I had a house 
and a job. <laughs> and I, you know, it was really an easy transition for me. And it's paradise. And it was always my dream to do it at some point. And but these were barstool dreams. They were never going to come true. So, you know, <laughs> what do you mean? I, it was, explain what you mean by barstool dreams. The uh, oh, you just, know, prior to sobriety, I, I would tell you, shit, I'm out. I, I, fuck, I would I basically lie. I'll admit that I'd do like tell story, talk story like, oh, my sister's out there. I wouldn't so much lie, but I put a, such a twist on it that it made it like mm-hmm. I'm connected to Hawaii. I'm out there all the time when it's just. You know, and one day I'm going to move out there and just it's all bar stuff. It's all this imaginary, um, you know, stuff that we we fluff up. It's the things that we want to do that somehow become a reality after maybe the sixth round. And you you know what (laughs) I mean? Yeah, I do. Yeah. uh, When you take a real honest approach and you get it together. So I start. it's time to start living some dreams, you know, and right at that same time, too. My my father had passed and my stepfather had passed. Uh, I was at both their bedsides um when they they died basically me holding their hands and i go life this is it It, it's on you know there's and not a like i'm gonna be gonna pull the sheets over my head and go into this depression i i went the opposite direction i go let's celebrate life let's bring this on and i started you know after a couple years of sobriety you start waking up you know i came out of that brown out and i had no fear so i go let's live these dreams and and Kauai was one of them and it was such a magical move. I'm so stoked I did. I've never had a drink on this island. And I got here that wow. afternoon and went straight to a, a sunrise meeting the next morning and have been connected ever since. So it got me up from behind the bar. And um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I, got a, I got a career. I have a checking account. I had, you know, when I, when I got that third DUI, I had 50 bucks in the bank and a bus pass and an expired license, you know, and it's, we chip away, but I have much more than all the, 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 the stuff. Um, I'm getting my yeah. sanity back, you know, I'm getting the, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's neutral. It's easier. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, I love that idea of you're like, well, it's time to start living some dreams and all the, all the smoke that we blow up our own asses, you know, sitting on the bar stool, talking to some stranger next to us, telling them about what we're going to do one day. One day, if, if we could just get out of this, but I just got to get out out from under this, and I'll be fine. I'm gonna go there, and it's always one day. Yeah, you yeah. know. And um, sure. I, one of the other um, one of the other connections we have is, you know, I moved into the place that you moved into, or that you were living in. Yeah. You were. You had decided, I'm sober. I'm going to Hawaii. I got myself a career. I'm gonna get out from behind the bar. And um, you were like, John, I got this place, man. And at the time I was getting I wasn't getting evicted, but they were selling my house. And so they told me I had 60 days to leave. It, basically, it was an eviction. Um, and you said, come right. into this place. And I remember driving what seemed to me was an eternity to drive from N- Napa to your house to that. This house was like 30 right. minutes away because I was so fucking hung over and shaky and like just barely hanging on i was like i'll get up there and i'll go talk to him and i came in and you're packing all your stuff up and you're like you can have this man you just gotta you know talk to the landlord and you were like the big screen tv is not coming with me the bed the furniture like it's all here all you gotta do is just put the deposit down and move right in and you were like hey man do you want a beer i got some beers left or whatever and you didn't care you were like yeah if you want a beer and i was thinking to myself thank god i need a beer to be able to drive home yeah yeah. And that that afternoon and we just sat there and we talked and I don't remember if you brought up like sobriety or AA. I mean, you may have. I, I don't remember. What, I think what and this is interesting, too, because I'm seeing some people at my current job right now. I'm in this kind of boiler mm-hmm. room, high pressure sales thing, real estate and all that. And they're, they're, they're heavy drinkers. And I've never pushed AA, but I would I I joke about it. And right. I don't care if you drink around me. I'm very unique that way. I was very comfortable behind the bar my my first two years. So alcohol doesn't scare me. It's an industry. It's a, it's an item. It's a it's a thing. You know, it, it's mm-hmm. a, it doesn't terrify me at all. I'm not afraid of it. I I'm I'm comfortable around it. I don't keep it in the house or or hang out in bars anymore. But the thing is, I think 
what you saw, I would occasionally come and I always like to sit at the bar and I'd go into, you know, where you work there and, and, and I had dinner and mm-hmm. I tell you I'm sober and you'd ask questions like, well, how's that working out? Are you still doing that thing? Yeah. You know, uh-huh. yeah. I didn't talk about it the first year and then I started getting into it. And I think, you you know, I just dropped a little, little, it was more example. It was promotion, you know, it wasn't promotion, but you know, it was just kind of living the lifestyle. So, yeah. You know, one bar, we're exactly alike in the, in the bartender thing. You know? It's just think, amazing. I didn't know you really had a, a big uh, problem. I'm just like, you know, <laughs> that's, I, you're hey, one that's... of the reasons I wanted to keep drinking. I'm going to, I, I got to keep, <laughs> if John can do it, <laughs> there's got, I can do it. Fucking I gotta, I by a like string, dog. man, by a string. I was right there with you, like dying. <laughs> I was drinking shots of vodka behind that bar. I'd get yeah. Nobody be looking. Nobody cared. I'm I'm the manager, you know. Man, it was your job. You'd come in later. You'd come in after me, you know, a couple hours or whatever, and I'd already be like three, four drinks in, and so just it's just amazing. And I, you know, that that afternoon, and then you leave, and I move in here. And you had left a uh, you'd left some literature for me in the bedside as well, sort of that, a that, <laughs> yeah, that brother. I mean that that's like my favorite story or anything because you 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 would I don't know if you remember this, but occasionally you'd call me at three o'clock in the morning and, <sighs> and hey, how do I what do you do? What's AA? What or how do you you know help <laughs> basically? Yeah. And I'd flat out tell you. Hey man, just get to a meeting, go check it out. You know, you don't have to sign anything. Just see if you hear something. If it makes sense, you don't have to commit. You know, it won't hurt. And I think you, a couple times you were going to go and then you didn't go. And I was mm-hmm. like, I kept dropping that. And then. But I was the one who kept you, calling. <laughs> you kept, you'd call, you know, and, and I had a couple other guys over the years that would do that. You know, they call you at three in the morning and just, but we're, we're tight. I mean, we're, we're bros. So I was yeah. stoked. And, and then I started to to kind of get where where you're at. I'm like, you know, you know, you know, if you got a problem, and you're telling me you got a problem, so there it is. And yeah, when I moved out, you bought all my furniture, and you know, or left my furniture and the TV and the bed and the nightstand. So yeah. I had an extra big book and a that schedule. That's awesome. Uh huh. I took a picture of that even, and I I go, he, he's gonna open this up, and I think it was you were you were getting pretty close, like you'd gone to your first meeting and. It made a little sense. That was the, so. That was the thing is that so I'm sitting and I I white knuckled it for two months in this room, in ah. your old bedroom, like watching Netflix and drinking you know fizzy water, like eating fucking ice cream bars and like pounds of M and M's, just like I can't drink, I just can't drink, I just can't drink, and like driving myself crazy in this room, you know. <laughs> And finally, I think I was texting back and forth. And the thing I remember is you say, there's a meeting tomorrow morning, just go. And I had texted you back and I had said at the time, it, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, I'll promise to do something tomorrow. I don't have to worry about it till tomorrow or whatever. And I was like, fine, I'll go. I promise I'll go. And then I was like, oh, shit, I said I promised. Now I got to go. And I remember – Working that night, so I worked late on Saturday night, and I was like, you know what? I'll go, but I'm not setting my alarm. And then I woke up early anyway, and I was like, shit. Well, I'm up, so I got to get up. So I get up, and I'm like, I don't know exactly where it is. I'm going to go drive there, and it's at this, like, rec center or whatever. And if I can't – meeting too. Yeah, I, I was yeah. like, if I can't find it, I'm just going to leave. And so I walk around the building, and I can't find it. And I'm like, well, if I don't see anybody to talk to – then I'm just going to I'm just going to leave. I'm going to run home. And then somebody walked right in front of me and was like it was like all these things I kept saying. I basically I was kind of asking for things I needed. Yeah. And every single step of the way I was getting something that I needed. Right. And until I let it, I sat down in there and I don't remember if I cried or not, but it was like huge. Like, oh shit. All the roadblocks were removed in all your conditions. Yeah were met <laughs> and it started because i promised you and i know like you said a lot of people start off because they're trying to get something back or do something for somebody whether it's a wife or a family member or a job or whatever and but that was the that was the catalyst was it was like this place this this sort of this sanctuary i don't know what there's something 
magical about this place, at least as far as sobriety and, yeah, you know, it's like this weird halfway house for recovering alcoholic bartenders. <laughs> well, in that room too. I mean, I I I slept in that bed with a, a six pack. Well, I, I weaned myself. That board right behind you. I'm looking at it. Mm-hmm. I've actually made a schedule because I didn't want to go through the DTs like I had done before when I was in the hospital there. And I'm like, you know, you, I was reading how you can have a stroke and the whole thing. So I'd started off, I, I weaned myself off. I went four beers one day, three beers the next day. I was going to do my own personal rehab. Oh, Got wow. down to two beers. And then I kept a six pack in the refrigerator in case I started freaking out. And I never did. And then I got into the meetings and it all, you know, again, I was looking for reasons I shouldn't stop or it's going gonna, it's gonna to kill me if I mm-hmm. stop. You know, whatever your mm-hmm. mind, the alcoholism doesn't want you to to end it. And every little thing is like an excuse not to stop what you've done, you know, your, your second nature. So, you know, I, it still baffles me how we get here, you know, and it's just a matter of showing up and being open to it. And it mm-hmm. just, it's, it's a pretty magical thing. Like you were that day. I mean, that, that's, that's an awesome story, brother. And when I, when I hear that, I've shared that with a couple of people and all the roadblocks blocks were lifted every single time I, I said, this is what's going to stop me. That one thing was taken away, you know? And so for that that's, day, yeah, for that day. That and day, so I know there's, there's something been a lot more. Yeah. There's just there's something about that. Mm hmm. Um, that higher power or whatever you want to call it, if you want to call it luck or fate or the cosmos or the universe or God or whatever word you want to use, it was there that day. And I really feel like it was in some way coming through you, if not from you, it was, it was definitely working through you because those were those rough nights where I was still, I'd been sober for 60 days or something like that, but I was not well. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Those first couple of months are fucking hell. The yeah. first couple of years sometimes. Just to get it all out of your system, whether you're, yeah. you know, for me too, it's just a complete overhaul. Like I gave up cigarettes the exact same time. My my whole thing is I only smoked when I drank, but I drank every day. So it was this whole <laughs> bullshit. Like I'm not a smoker or thing, but it, but so you kind of come off all the, all the goodies and maybe pick up some, uh, you know, Ben and Jerry's along the way and you, so you start you know where where do you finally level out you know what's your your thing and you know our not similar sponsor but you know Big John he's another mm-hmm. guy down there he's like this isn't a this isn't a fucking health club you know so don't you know there's a lot of other things wrong with you that you're, you're not even aware of and I'm like fuck right. what do you know dude and, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden <laughs> they started unraveling so you know, it's more than just getting sober. It's more than getting your health back. It's more than the clarity. It's uh, you know, the, the peace of mind. And 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 you know, as corny as it may sound, but I'm able to love now. Um, that wasn't a thing or a priority or an, it wasn't part of the yeah. agenda. You know, <laughs> I didn't want to. I didn't want to get involved. If you got involved with me, it was your collateral damage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was on you. You know. That's beautiful, man. That's, I mean, what do you, uh, like, what is life like today? You know, what is, I mean, out there on the islands? I mean, I see all your pictures on Instagram of whether it's out on the coast. You got a few little, like, cool what meditation spots and yeah. water. You know, I, I when I started doing the steps, I thought the one step that I would never be into or really you know we pick and choose or somehow in the beginning there and i'm like i'll, I'll never meditation and prayer except 10 i'm like this that's not for me you know kind of 10 and 11 kind of go side by side there and i'm like but now you get here and i'm not, I'm not all hippied out i'm not kind of yeah you know, existing on moringa and wheatgrass and, and <laughs> doing yoga on a daily basis but you know it's a spiritual place it's yeah nature, and so i i get attuned to that and that's kind of my my Zen moment or whatever is along these cliffs out here. And, you know, I've had a chance to kind of get through sobriety, travel, go overseas, you know, and I just came back from a few weeks of, you know, Tahoe, uh, had a chance to go to Vietnam. And these are the, again, the bar bartending, uh, barstool dreams. There's a lot of Mm -hmm. that stuff coming true. Travel is very important to me, you know, and I thought, God, I could never, fuck, how am I going to go to an an airport? You know, I just had a nine over layover in, in, 
in San Francisco there, and they had a wine bar, this swanky little wine bar <laughs> right there, and I just looked at it, and people are swirling and not spitting, and I'm like, I, I wasn't even really drawn to that, you know, and I didn't mm -hmm. mind, I wasn't freaked out about my plane being hit by lightning coming in from there. I'm glad I wasn't on it, and all the, you know, it's, things don't bother me as, as much, so basically life here is, uh, you know, it, it, we, I, I deal with life on life's terms, um, I, I get in a, a couple meetings a week. I sponsor a couple guys here and there. Um, I don't push the program. I, I, I don't push uh, my view of a higher power on anybody, but it's a collaborative effort. So I don't, I don't even look at it as sponsees. I mean, I'm getting more from these guys than, than what, it, whatever I'm doing for them. I, you know, it's a, this really thing like me and you just sharing right now and how that room and, and, my example and then the book or whatever that's all it was i handed you a book and you did the rest of the work and and you know it's really yeah. a lead program brother you know and i i love that whole aspect of it you know that's what it's about I, my ego doesn't want me to stop this my ego tells me occasionally whispers oh, you got mm -hmm. this you, five and a half years you know how to not drink now and but i know when you play it forward, it ain't going to be any different. I know it's not. You know? <laughs> it, it, it'd take a week, it'd take a year, it would take a day, but pretty soon I'd be back to drinking that Grey Goose warm by myself yeah. in the morning. And that, that's just the reality. I'm an alcoholic. You know, there's no doubt about it. I admit it. I'm powerless. And it took me a long time to say that. Um, I, I definitely, I knew I was powerless, but I thought I could manage it. Now I yeah. <laughs> I can barely manage it sober. But, uh, right? I mean, life is hard enough, whether than fucking pouring whiskey on top of it and setting yeah. it on fire. Um, But I just think about, like you said, the travel. You went to Vietnam, and you got to come back here and visit for a day or two and was able to, like, you came and stayed at the resort, and we got to just hang out by the pool. And stuff like that was, to me, was so special to be able to share that with you and I, I i often think about like if i had not decided to get sober we wouldn't be talking i probably still i probably would have gotten kicked out of this house oh yeah I would, yeah <laughs> i would have broke some shit and drank We're too much talk about the landlord there but... no no but you know so it was just like that was such an awesome trip to see you and to hang out and i remember you saying too like it's funny the shit you never think about the shit you say until somebody else is like you know what you said to me two years ago that stuck in my head we were sitting at that fancy dinner right we we're like doing all this and you were talking right. about meditation you just you know you just said well meditation i never thought and you were like there's this app it's called headspace and wow. you know i don't this is not a promotion for them it's a great app um and you were like, and I said, yeah, man, I got the 10 day free trial, but it's like a hundred dollars a year. And you're like, dude, how much are you going to spend on this dinner right here? How much are you going to spend on that steak? You're going to get the steak and the scallops. You're going to get three bottles of Pellegrino and uh, some chocolate mousse and some oysters and all this shit. And you're like, you're going to spend at least a hundred dollars tonight. You can't spend a hundred dollars for the next year for your own mental health. Yeah. And yeah, I was isn't like, that a trip how we look at it like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's I unreal. Was, Fuck. He's right. Talk about that, too. I mean, the day I stopped drinking, I, I tripled my income. I mean, I, I spent 70 <laughs> percent of everything that came in was going to some other bar down the road or, or some fine somewhere or whatever the, the thing. Yeah. Was, you know, lost wages and things. But um, but it, it's nice, you know, you know, and the promises, it's not a. Uh, financial insecurity will you know leave me but it's not like that doesn't mean we're going to be rich but we don't worry about all the little shit you know living in constant struggle mm -hmm. gymnastics yeah. and what we did the night before or how we're going to get out of it or you know this that and another thing it just sobriety such a gift and such it's just a, the easier softer way man it just truly truly is it's just consistent i think and in, in my experience you know, anybody that's hearing this kind of in their, the beginning of it, it takes a while. <laughs> hang Fair, in there. Yeah. Hang in there. <clears throat> so, yeah, that was going to be what I wanted to ask you is if you had any advice for people who are just starting off. Hang in there. and. Well, for me, too, I, and I don't know if this would work for anybody else, but I, I made a, yeah. you know, a commitment myself to to just write it out and, and, and see what happens. Do the steps. Like I said, the, the bar... All that shit is 
going to always, always be there. But, but see how your life changes. If it starts getting better and you feel better and you start hearing things that you need to hear and, you know, just like we're sharing right here, you know, it's not for everybody. And, and AA is, you know, it, other people get sober without it. You know, Ken, our, our my grand sponsor, you know, Ken, who had 52 mm-hmm. years of sobriety, he didn't push AA. He, he pushed, you know, living a, a kinder life and, and, but he, he shared with me in a nutshell that there's other ways of getting sober besides just AA. And I didn't understand that because I'm like, we're in, the, we're in a meeting. How, could, how dare you say that with 52 years? But for me, AA is the only thing that's, that's work. I need a little structure in my life. Yeah. Fuck, it's 12 steps. If you can't apply those and at least do a dry run through it, you know, you don't need to spend years on the fourth step. How many cocktails did you memorize over the years? You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I, I to me it's the program. Don't don't half guess it. Don't kind of just do it. It's set up, and it's almost I don't want to. I'll never say flawless, but it's set up in a, in a way that is shouldn't be messed with. I mean the the old timers. I don't know how they figured this stuff out, and Bob and you know it's unreal. And I just say apply it. If it works, good on you. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so you got you it. got um. Yeah, you got tomorrow off. You said it's your Friday. A couple days off here. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, what are I'm you in the transition. Do? In the transition of maybe taking a, a another another job somewhere else, kind of a lateral move, you know. And mm-hmm. I'm I'm right there on that. Um, but yeah, there's some some good opportunities. It just it just blows me away that these things keep popping up, and I can. I can uh, beat them head on, so that's kind of where I'm at. But yeah, tomorrow is uh, hopefully you know another beach day. Get out there. Yeah. My awesome. goal is is to walk around this entire island. The circumference of Kauai is 111 miles around the cliffs and things, and I've done you know 60 miles of it. Just things like that. You know, I, I like to get in nature. That's my trip. And yeah. um, you know, there might be some surf tomorrow. Who knows? But and I'm gonna catch a meeting. I do the Wednesday night meeting, so that's 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 where I'll be. Awesome. That's what I'll be doing. Well, thanks, John. I appreciate it. It's it's nice to talk to you. And I heard some stuff today that I don't think that I'd heard or I didn't remember. So I appreciate you uh, you sharing this with me and with everybody. Thank yeah, buddy. You. Without a doubt. <laughs> Keep it up. Thanks for what you're doing, man. Uh, I just got to throw this in here too. Mm-hmm. I, you took a big leap of faith of putting this thing together and. Uh, you know, keep it up, man. I, I love hearing it, and, and uh, I know other people have too, and I kind of share it around the way. Um, so. Thank you. Will, right, I will. All right, man. All right, John. Thank Follow. you. Thanks again for listening. Our music, as always, is by Neglect. You can find more of his stuff at neglect.bandcamp.com. And you can find us on all social media platforms that matter. Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can reach us at aisforalcoholic at gmail.com. Talk to you later. Yeah.